Worst car I've ever took on in my entire career. Graveyard cars in five. Junk. Four. Wadded and twisted. Three. Should have been scrapped. Two. Man, that car's bad. On February 24th, 1971, this 440 six-pack Cuda was born. On July 5th, 1980, it was raced, wrecked, and left for dead. Now, 30 years after its demise, Mark Warman and the GYC Ghouls want to reanimate this long-deceased, lost and forgotten American legend. Ride along as Mark and crew turn back the clock to 1971 and attempt their greatest undertaking yet on this season of Graveyard Cars. Graveyard Cars isn't a fantasy show, it's a reality show. It's a reality show about restoring Chrysler muscle cars back to their OE condition. We make them perfect, exactly the way they were the day they left the showroom floor. That takes time, it takes expertise, years of experience. Quite frankly, it takes me. The cars that I restore on Graveyard Cars, they're dead. I don't do cars that need a paint job. I don't do cars that need a little fluff on the interior. In some cases, they've been on fire. They've been hit by a train. They've been sideswiped. They've been buried, burned, blasted. We crushed better cars than these. I'll be using equipment you've never seen in any other television show. We use a frame rack that has the collective ability between three towers of pulling 30 tons. It can split your skull open. Reality television is no longer real. You are not gonna completely restore an automobile in seven days regardless of the size of the crew. It's not going to look the way you want it to in a week from that. Every piece of material that you put on that car takes time to cure. If it was a thousand degrees, maybe you're working on the sun, you know, but here on earth, it actually takes a lot longer than that for stuff to cure. I don't have a magic wand I can wave over it. I have these two meat hooks, which I've been told are like Vienna sausages at the end of my hands. This is reality television. I have four guys that work alongside me. They may not be the brightest bulb on the string, but they're good workers and they're cheap. When I'm finished working on a car, I won't set any time records on it, but you can bet one thing, it'll be the best there is. So welcome to the Mopar Mausoleum. Most of these cars are parts cars. There are a few of them that are getting restored, like this Charger. But the challengers that you see here will donate body parts and pieces and nuts and bolts and fasteners that are imperative to restore the cars that we're working on. A lot of this stuff just isn't made anymore. I mean, we can get new reproduction fenders, but you can't go in and you can't get a reproduction wiper motor. You can't get the correct nuts and the bolts that fasten all those pieces together. Uh, we'll come out here like Frankenstein did for his monster and grab body parts and pieces, clean them up, recondition them, and put them on the cars that we're working on inside. Currently, we're working on several cars for my best client up in Canada, Larry. We're working on three cars that he has inside the shop, and we're about three more out here that are ready to go through, plus two more up in Alberta. And we're, of course, finishing the world-famous 71 Cuda, 446-pack, four-speed, 354 Dana, one of 108 ever made. Well, hello there. I suppose some of you are wondering what an OE restoration is. So I commissioned my graveyard ghouls to prepare this short educational film. Please enjoy. From the earliest horse-drawn buggy to Henry Ford's affordable mass-produced Model T, man has sought the most efficient mode of transportation. At first a mere means of conveyance, it didn't take long for the automobile to become available to everyone, and the age of customizing was born. From chop to drop, space to race, and from mild to wild, the automobile has taken many forms. By the late 1930s, the need for speed was quickly transforming the automobile. In the 1950s, the term hot rod was officially coined, and with the drive-in generation nurturing this trend, hot rods became as popular as reading glasses for chihuahuas. <clears throat> well, 
Let's just say they were very popular. By the mid-1960s, street racing had become so popular that even the car manufacturers got involved. This was the dawn of the muscle car era. In 1971, in what most consider the muscle car's pinnacle year, Chrysler fused the legendary 426 Hemi with a compact and sure-footed Plymouth Barracuda. Now, nearly 40 years later, the 1971 Cuda is on record as the most valuable muscle car to date. By 1972, in response to an unexplainable increase in teen accidents, rising fuel costs, and unaffordable insurance, Detroit heeded the signs of the times and laid to rest the muscle car forever. Recently, automobile enthusiasts have raised the bar once again with the introduction of original equipment, or OE, restoration. They believe duplicating a car to original factory specifications stands as a symbol to our automotive heritage and the technology of yesteryear. Date-coated parts are documented, rivets and welds placed exactly, even assembly line markings and paint jobs are recreated, all for a car to look as though it just rolled off the assembly line. The manufacturer had a protocol that each car met prior to being shipped. This is the exact condition an OE car must achieve. It is this attention to detail that has given Graveyard Cars international recognition as a leader in Mopar restoration. The Red 69 Coronet is supposed to be done February 1st. Being tomorrow. This is tomorrow. <laughs> we might make it. Coronet was the first Dodge to receive the optional Road and Track, or RT, performance package. The 440 Magnum and legendary Hemi Coronet RTs ruled the streets and dominated the drag strips until their demise in 1970. Today, they stand as a monumental reminder to the phrase, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Today's prices on the famous Coronet RT run the gamut, with some models recently changing hands for as much as seven figures. Uh, I bought the 69 Coronet RT out of Cottage Grove. When the car was up in Alaska, it got in an accident where it hit a moose and it ripped the left front apron pretty high on it. So we ended up having to replace the left front inner structure on the front end of the car. Uh, I had a 68 Coronet RT donor that I used the front inner structure off of for that car. So we retained the original VIN numbers in the upper tie bar. Fernando did a lot of body work on it. Uh, I you know, expected to do too much work and it was a nightmare. Well, this car should have took about six months to a year to do, but what happened was after we bought it, my guy in Canada, Larry, my friend now, uh, started getting interest in other cars, and every time we'd start working on the Coronet, he'd buy another car and put ahead of it. We had other cars, we had a Challenger we had to get done, we had a Charger we had to get done, we had a GTX that we had to get done. When we got serious back on the car about six months ago, uh, Larry said, let's get that car wrapped up, it's been a part too long. There was times it sat for months. We were about three and a half, four months into that, which was really about two months to three months worth of work left when I helped him strike a deal to trade it for a 70 Dodge Challenger RT 446 pack. Mark blamed it on Larry, yes, Larry pulled the plug on the funding of the car. Well, the timeline got shaved considerably. It went from having two to three months left to having two to three weeks left on it. The car was not gonna be finished or completed in time. It was very tight, very tight. Yeah, it was a setback. We were really scrambling to get that car done on time and meet the deadline. You know, my worst fear was when we started making the pulls on it, that the quarter panels were just going to rip off the car, that the roof was going to pull away from the eight pillars, that the firewall wasn't going to walk out. Uh, so it was important, other than Fernando uh, and myself, we're the only ones that have actually done the frame and the unibody work before. So it was real important to get everybody together on the same page of the book, find out exactly where we're going to make our pulls and how we're going to make our pulls. Okay, you see the crease? It's just like your nose right on the side, right there. I don't think that's creased as much as my nose. Actually, so, it looks pretty much good It does image. actually, doesn't it? I have to agree with you on that one. We can't start cutting off old sheet metal with the intention of replacing it while the car is still twisted. So was this car a fog light car or not? Because in 71 it was an option on it was a Scooter. An, be showing off the camera. 
you know, I'm just talking to you. Everybody out there already knows that. So it's very important to make those pulls in the right areas so that we can have a square car when we start welding it back together again. Now, does ICAR recommend that type of stuff? I don't care what ICAR recommends. No, but really, truthfully, is the good question. Well, I don't, well, I don't think there's rails. any data I'd have on to it. agree with Mark. I don't really... Absolutely. They put sleeves in there? They just tell you specifically how to do it. Like in that case, I'm pretty sure that's how they would do it, like Joe said. He rides on Mark's coattails. You know, whatever Mark says is good, and he will suck up to Mark and say the same thing that Mark just said, so Mark loves it. And Joe doesn't argue with him. Joe is a good restoration technician on his way to being a great restoration technician. If, if I told Joe to do something, Joe would do it. Uh, but he might come up to me and say, hey, listen, you know, yeah, it's definitely looking in the book and it's not right. Definitely use the 2998-956 radiator. He kind of talks like rain then, but... Whatever Mark says and goes, Joe goes along with. F is 440. Gee, you are you C. talking while I'm talking? Why? You must have C. I just said C. I just said D. Why would I... You did say D <laughs> twice. I, I, was I said to back up, but you missed C. And I'm just sitting back there. Well, he is a suck up. <laughs> Of all the people in the shop that tend to argue with me the most, it's hands down Darren. He is without a doubt, and this isn't just me saying it, the single most annoying man that God ever created in the history of humanity. And I know that sounds like an incredibly large overstatement, but it's not. I don't wholeheartedly agree with him on trying to save a lot of these panels. When you're gonna splice on to me, what difference to make if you got seven eighths of the quarter or or 100 percent of the quarter on there to me when you begin to lose original parts off the car you begin to lose its value you take off both quarters going to be replaced five percent he's talking about saving the right quarter panel i i don't see it i don't care if i have to pay fernando 60 hours to fix a chunk of metal on the quarter panel that big it's worth it in the end value of the car versus replacing it with a brand new panel. Yeah, I'd rather have with a, with a good piece in there than take another piece and try to straighten it and put it back on the car myself. Once it's been cut off, it's been cut off. Quarter panel's only original one time. Well, I like to start pull hands and start playing around. I'm sorry. I like to play right now. I can't understand him. Fernando is difficult to understand. <laughs> They, he knew you had to shop it up and he had new ones. Fernando has worked with me for over 20 years. Uh, he is one of the best technicians I've ever worked with. Uh, he can do frame and unibody like nobody else can do it. Uh, he doesn't speak any kind of a vocabulary of any sort. He makes noises and so I work together with him on the noises and try to figure out what they mean. Nando, you need anything come over up the put or no? You good? Okay, so what I just asked him, very simple, would you like some help putting the door on the Ford truck? And he said, no, he's fine, so. You know, to the naysayers that say this car is impossible to restore, you know, I can't argue with them until I've actually done it. I think that we'll end up saving about half the floor, all the firewall, we'll save the roof, the sail panels down as far as we can get them. We'll probably, I'm missing, it's obviously in bad shape, till I can actually put my seal on it and say that I'm done. And this is done the way Mark Warman at Graveyard Cars would do it. Wanted to, you don't think you could fix this? This 71 Cuda is about as bad as I've ever built. There's a lot of dissent. Nando thinks it's junk. Yeah. He can't wait to go on it. <laughs> he told me earlier it's all going to pull apart. Nando, you didn't say that, right? Yes, he did. <laughs> you didn't say it going to be easy. It going to be easy. <laughs> Why do you make stuff up? I Just didn't, to I didn't make that up. Ask if he said it easy. or not. Oh, he said it. Look me in the eye without smiling and say it's the truth. The truth. It's Honestly. the truth. See, why are you smiling like a fool? Because you're lying, that's nope. why. Nando, did you say that? This car will be restored back to OE standards using as much original sheet metal as humanly possible. I just started writing a list of what I think the body parts that we're going to have to replace are going to be. You can do anything. It just takes but money. Who's doing that? Who's saying that? Oh, hi. We're down here. Royal and I grew up together. Uh, even back at 12 years old, he still needed his space. Always needed his space. What do you do? You don't do anything. He doesn't go to school. He dropped out. He sits around all day. Why would he need more space? I don't know. He's a pretty knowledgeable Mopar guy. I've taught him everything he knows. He drives a 67 Coronet RT, 440 automatic car that I helped him restore a few years ago. Won a couple of best in uh, show paint jobs. And uh, that's 
probably because I painted it. He likes to really make fun of Royal's head. Royal has no hair on his head. And he calls him Chrome Dome. And makes fun of him having a helmet on all the time. And hey, Royal, turn that light off over there. And there's no light over there. It's, just, it's really the Royal's head with no hair. It just shines. Sure, my shining personality. Lights up every room. You get as correct as you can get. That's all you do. Right, Ron? Absolutely. There's a shine in here. I wonder what that is. The guy with the built-in football helmet. You know, I don't consider it an insult. I consider it helping people recognize shortcomings that they have that maybe somebody else is too uh, politically correct to point out to them, like Royal being bald. And I bring that up in kind of a humorous fashion, so I'm, you know, I don't want to hurt his feelings, so I'll make a uh, comparison to a football helmet. Mark is insulting me on a daily basis. That's part of who he is. If a person looks like an animal or is follically challenged, I don't know, is it bad to point that out to him? Hey, everybody, look at the dolphin. I brought up a picture of Flipper today coming up out of the water <laughs> with his mouth open like that because I told you you look like a dolphin. Absolutely. You put a picture of Flipper here. You put a picture of Darren here and you ask yourself, have you ever seen those two identities at the same place at the same time? The answer's no. You know, it was funny at the time and I think Darren got a kick out of it. Later he says, why do you call me a dolphin? So I brought up a picture, you know, of Flipper. And it seems to me that there's a lot of, there's a strong likeness between Flipper and Darren. I've discussed that with my wife and other people. They just don't see the resemblance. I don't see the resemblance. I look at him and I don't see Flipper, but... No, I don't see the resemblance. I see Mark is more like Flipper to me. Because Mark's got a bigger nose. You can almost rest a cup of coffee on there if he's sitting down. It, it kind of goes out there and down. Yeah, I make Flipper sounds. Darren. No, I cannot communicate with dolphins or the dead or anything, no. And the more surgeries Darren has, the more he looks like a dolphin. He's had a hundred surgeries. Has he ever thought about maybe, you know, de-dolphining? I mean, pretty soon we're going to be throwing him in a pool and charging an admission. I don't float well. It has to do with bone density. And I really don't like water that well. From the time Larry pulled the trigger on the car deal, I had two weeks to get the car done. And in reality, there was about six weeks worth of work left on it. So here we have this car completely painted by our painter, but apart. We're flying along thinking everything's great. And it isn't until we started bolting the car together that we noticed none of the panels matched each other. You really can't put all the pieces together. You can't put the seats in. You can't put the interior. The, I mean, basically everything. I mean, if you're going to have to repaint it again. Mark was a little stressed. I knew that that was going to set us back anywhere from three days to a week. When the car's going in two weeks and every day is planned out, Three days is a long time. So we were certainly under the gun, probably more so on that car than I've been on any other car. I had doubts whether we'd make it for the coronet. Yeah, I mean, I really did. When I hung the door on the coronet, it just exactly happened what I didn't want to happen. The colors didn't match. He didn't put enough coverage on the body and he did put enough on the doors so when we hung all the sheet metal on it this looked orange and this looked red which is exactly what I asked him not to do. We put the doors on the fenders on then you you're looking at it as a whole picture and you can clearly see you know you have a red car and an orange car. To properly do one of these cars body and paint it's it takes time time for the bondo to cure properly for the primers to cure properly but when those products cure they shrink if we were to force this thing all the primer all the bondo all the paint all the base and all the clear in just a couple of days six months from now it would be all sucked back and hazed over it looks like you know a mass production cheap paint job the problem about some of those shows is the camera hides everything so when the cameras dive around these cars they look like a sheet of glass i don't know maybe they got magic paint Maybe they got the paint from the same place Jack got his beanstalk beans from. I don't know. All I know is mine takes a lot longer to cure. Has this been, looks like this has been painted before. <laughs> you know damn good and well it has. You know exactly why too. Why? Not everything's a setup for the camera. Yeah, I try to set him up a little bit. So if you do paint the panels off the car, it 
two different times, it's supposedly, if you put the same number of coats, it's gonna match. As long as it's covered, whatever that decision is, so what I do is I take the paint and I get a spray out card, which is black and white checkerboard, hold it up to the sun and see how many coats of paint it actually takes to cover it. That's the real answer. If it's 10 coats, it's 10 coats. It's not magic paint. It doesn't have a brain of its own and say, oh, we should match, because Mark didn't want it that way. It would have been a lot faster if the paint had matched. Yeah, I mean, it sets you back quite a bit because you have to re-prep everything. It's a pretty color when it's all done. Just a beautiful color. If somebody orders it from the factory, let's say they go into Dodge and they order the car, say, I want a Coronet, but I want it all red. Right. Would that still be a factory car and not custom? Custom is something that's done after the manufacturer's completely done with it. Yeah. So yeah. But if you, you order could, it from the factory, you custom. You could walk into the factory in 1970 and say, I want a pink Cuda 440 four speed with white interior and a white stripe on it. And as crazy as that sounds today, that is a factory car. It's also a very rare car. The paint code is FM3, Foxtrot Michael 3. You got to give him credit, you know. He, he knows more about this stuff than I do. Okay. And they say pink cars are the lowest demographic made, except in the AAR and the TA. They actually made quite a few of those. But you don't know if this car was fresh ordered like this or just came like this. Can you actually work? Who are you, you know? talking to? Well, I just, I just see you kind of walking around over there. Would I consider Mark to be a motivator of people? No, not really. No. It doesn't seem to work on me. <laughs> okay, we're about done here. Yeah, because I think... Uh... I got to have this thing in the booth. Rain Man, make sure you get that 71 Barracuda up on that hoist for me, though. Consider it done. Yeah, consider it done. So what we're getting ready to do is set up the Genesis measuring system. It's an electronic measuring system. It uses these little scanner bars. What I'm going to do is we're going to measure this car, which is a 71 Barracuda 318. So we can take the measurements from this car that we know are right, or factory, and use them on our other car over there, the 71 six count car. Okay, buddy. So what we're going to do now is lower the car down so that the scanner can actually read these targets. We don't have targets long enough to hang that low. And what it's going to do while it's up, I'll show you, is it's going to take this light beam and with the computer, it's going to measure the amount of time it takes to get from the middle of this to here, then from there over to there. The longer it takes, the further they are away from each other. So it, it, in essence, it's going to build this square that we call a torque box. A torque box is an imaginary set of points on a car that we establish to be a beginning point for pulling. So a torque box oftentimes is four points that make up a square that the measuring system can recognize as good established solid starting points. Because if a car is all wadded up like this, 
you, it's hard to hang targets somewhere, and if you did hang them, they, the numbers that it would send back to the computer would be erroneous. So you have to get the car square and flat in a good torque box before you start making the poles and before you start measuring out the rest of the unibody on it. Most guys who have ever restored a car will tell you half the fun is the hunt. So ever since I was a kid and I would round up a car and make a deal on it, I always would take my time after getting the car and figure out where was it sold new, who owned it, where's the motor if it's gone, where's the transmission if it's gone. Today it's not just about the fun of it, but can also add to the value of the car. So if I were to take my 71 Cuda and go out and find the original motor and the original transmission, then that could add to the value of the car. Normally I have a nice little notebook that I work with, but because of the show, because my eyes aren't what they were a mere 20 years ago, I kind of built this board, which I like to call the murder board. I can go back and reflect on what I know, what I'm still looking for, and I can do all that at a glance. I know from the original fender tag that the car was built on February 24th, 1971. It was built in Hamtrak, Michigan. The VIN tells you that. I also know that it was wrecked on July 5th, 1980, and that was the last time the car was ever on the road. When I talked with Jerry, the young guy back then that wrecked the car on July 5th, 1980, the way he described it was he had ran into some buddies of his in another town when he was over getting refreshments. And on the way back, they were driving a Ford F-150 pickup, an older one, pre-70s. Uh, and he was driving the Cuda and they were playing leapfrog like we always did as kids, you know, hopping back and forth in front of each other. The truck was in front, the Cuda was behind as they came out of a corner. They come out of the corner, the Cuda went out around the Ford truck to get in front of it, got on the soft shoulder, overcompensated, spun around in front of the truck, the truck went past. As the truck went past, he remembers looking at the guy in the passenger seat of the truck with pretty big eyes as he went backwards into an embankment, crushing the left quarter, shot it across the street to the other embankment, and bounced it back into the middle of the road where it came to rest with no axle underneath it. Jerry told me that up until two years ago, the gouges in the blacktop were still there before the highway department repaved it. I spent a great deal of time making phone calls to different people involved in the ownership or knowledge of this car. And finally, after multiple phone calls to Jack, which netted me nothing, many, many phone calls to Jerry, which I did actually have a chance to physically talk to, I finally got hold of Craig Horesco, a great guy, heart of gold, and wanted to talk about the car. Is there any way for tomorrow at about like 10 in the morning, we'd have the room set up and ready to go? Might take 20 minutes. Oh, well, that's fine. I'll be there. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, I'm sitting here with Craig Caresco. Going to go over some questions. Craig used to own the car. Uh, when did you first hear about the Cuda? I had a girlfriend at that time. Uh, she told me about this 71 Cuda here in Springfield. I went over and looked at it, and uh, it was just beautiful shape. The only thing it was missing was the engine. So this is our orange 71 that this we're doing. This is the orange 71. So the body was? Great. Oh. Beautiful. I think I paid $500 for the car. <laughs> yeah, if you add some zeros to that, you're pretty close to what we pay too. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. You put the motor in it, made it run and drive. Was the transmission in it? Yes. So, so it was the original transmission at that time. Uh, Body-wise, did you add anything to the I, body? I put on, uh, there was a lug luggage rack that was on the 70 Cuda, and I took it off and put it on that car. Ah, so you installed the luggage I rack. I installed that. How long did it take you to sell the car? Four to six months it sat there alongside Highway 99 right outside of Monroe, and I had one collar on it. Yeah, that wouldn't be a problem today. <laughs> If you had a chance again to own a car just like that, is that what you would choose of your muscle car dreams? Yep. Just like Without that. Without a doubt. Yep. This Cuda, when I first laid eyes on it, it, I knew it was something special. A few people knew later what it was. What it was. Yeah. I didn't realize what it was when right. I owned it. So you didn't know it was one of 108 cars ever built. When did you hear about the accident? 
that totaled the car. I think one of my friends came up and told me and told me where it was sitting. It was originally towed to um, Monroe where they kept the school buses, right across from the post office. You guys, uh, that is a resurrection for sure, <laughs> that project, I, I don't know. Man, I couldn't imagine taking on something like that. But, and good luck with that. You, yeah. you got, must have the talent to take on something like that. Man. Well, thank that, you. That's great. After I met with Craig, he agreed to meet us out in Junction City and take us on a tour of what he knew were the historical landmarks of the car. And he took us out to the area where the car was wrecked because he had heard the urban legend of it too. You think we're safe to park here and walk it? Oh, let's do it. Let's get out and go. And so we found the original highway that it was wrecked on. We found the old Sheriff Carnahan's place. And we reenacted how the accident happened and where approximately it would have came to rest in the middle of that highway. The way it was described to me, he came out of that corner down there playing leapfrog with an old 67 Ford truck. He goes out and passes the truck but he gets over into this shoulder. And when he starts to get, starts to drift down, instead of just gently pulling the steering wheel back, he just cranked the wheel. So he says when he cranked the wheel, it came over into this embankment over here with the right quarter in first, because the car looped all the way around. It would have looped around in front of him, come in like this. It would have hit the left quarter, shot it across the street, and he would have ended up like he said. All of the facts added up specifically and exactly to the way the guy who wrecked the car said that it happened. After a little bit of research, we've narrowed it down to this stretch of highway because that house right there is where Sheriff Carnahan lived when Gary O'Brien wrecked that car. So if, he, if that was true, if he was within a 50 or 100 feet of his driveway, he's probably around here with that car setting. I mean, it, it's, it's possible that I'm off a few feet, but I bet I'm not off much. Somewhere in this very footprint right here is where that car came to rest. Part of restoring the car to me is knowing where it started. They say what is past is prologue. I believe that. Filling in those gaps is the most important part. Knowing where the car started life, knowing who all owned it. And I think anybody who's ever picked up an old antique at an antique store, one of the things that's fun is finding out where did it come from, who made it. Where did it spend its life? So the find, the history, the research, that's the best for me. What I've simulated so far is a timeline of where the car started and where it was wrecked. I'm gonna continue to add to the murder board as I go along. There's a lot more information I don't have. I hope that this is as enjoyable to watch as it is for me to fill out. I think by the time the car is restored in a year from now, this should be pretty much full of black ink and a lot of great memories. Should be a lamb fry and go hang this over there in the other target for me. What is a lamb fry? The car was too narrow, so one of the first things is it has to be the exact same torque box as the, as the factory specifications are. It just, it just pushes in. It's supposed to face a certain direction? Yeah, they have to face towards the scanner. And where's the scanner going to be? Where it is right now. Okay, I didn't see it there. Yeah, yeah, I can see where you might not. All right, turn it around to face the scanner. God, you're a miracle. It's just crazy, I know. I've never seen anything like that in all my days. Turn that target around and face the scanner. What scanner? The scanner's sitting right in front of you. I think we better start with our width right there. The width on the back is off too, it's 439 times 2, but the problem is in, until you have the width right, these numbers right here because they're too close together could be throwing everything else off. So really you kind of almost have to have your height and your width established, so we're just going to have to get as close as we can, then remeasure it. Just like with a piece of paper, if you take a piece of paper and you try to push it together, it crinkles. And in this case, that firewall did that right there. And that's what that front crinkle is in there. 
this crinkle right here is just like the paper did. It got shrunk, shrunk together. So we're gonna have to pull the width out and we're gonna have to pull the height down so it reads the exact same height as the good car. Then we can start dealing with going opposite directions, getting the back pulled out for length, getting the roof pushed, getting the front end over. So this is the first time this door's been open since July 5th, 1980. We're gonna see how much luck we have at it. I was afraid of that. Oh, wow. It did. Huh. Actually, the door jam. Wow. I bet that door could tell a story or two. It's actually in pretty good shape. This door jam's nice. Here's a lot of the original Hemi Orange paint. With this snatch block in place right here, we should be able to pull this rail both this way and down to a point where we'll have the right height for this pinch weld stand to go into. Okay. It needs a half an inch down. I need another pull. Yeah, I do it when I'm walking behind it because I like my face torn off. It could. That's one of the things I try to tell them always. Be careful. There's no careful. You see the hat? There's nothing in that hat. So while we had pressure on it, the firewall, it was nice that we could get in there and we could stress relieve the firewall where that big crease was. We got in there and we worked that around and that pulled out very nicely. You could watch it actually from the very front of the car as we were loading it up. It looks like everything pulled out actually pretty good. The frame rail came down to the height that it was supposed to be at and the pinch weld's exactly where it is on this side. We got some of the crinkle out for our first pull. It's really good. It's better than I thought it would be. I was kind of worried that, uh, that it wouldn't move, but you can see it's actually unwrapped from there a little bit. The firewall, after the pulls were made, I have absolutely no doubt I'll be able to save everything. I always thought that I could, and I was right about that. Some of the skeptics that roll their eyes and do their little huffy puffy things through their lungs were wrong, again. And uh, it was obvious as it was coming out that there was a bit of uh, jealousy in their faces, you could see it. If you guys ever caught them, if you go around the car and you kind of catch them back, you'll see that they're hiding their little, their green color of envy, because they know I was right. When Mark walks around, he walks with his chest way up here and lowers his voice. And he's almost like that Hell's Kitchen guy, whatever his name is. Uh, Mark, Mark abuses people very bad, constantly, 24 hours. Is the way that he is. Right there. You're a fool. First off, you know that's a... Right now, right now, you know you're going to be pushing me out. I can feel. Something's going to push you out. <laughs> His nose is so big, that every time that he lies, he's going to be growing, growing, growing. And I'm Pinocchio. Yeah. I'm the f***ing character from Disneyland, whatever. I never got to go. My dad died when I was 12. But if I had, I know that it's some kind of fairy tale about this doll that tells lies and his nose gets bigger. Is that what you're saying? You're saying every time I tell a lie, my nose gets bigger. I met with him. No. Have you ever seen yours? You look like you've been chasing parked cars. He says, you know that game. Grab your stuff. You mother. So I get close to a mirror and I can't see my own reflection. Yeah, he's the devil. That's the problem, buddy. It's the problem. Yeah. Put up that bull. What are you laughing about, you fing dolphin? Good job, Mando. That's bull. He didn't. Yeah, he held it good. Shut your face. <laughs> Tomorrow the coronet goes away. The guy's going to be here from Michigan to get it. Awesome. I come out to do the final wet sand and buff on the hood, and there's a dent in it. Hello, little dent. And we nobody. It just happened on its own. You might have heard of it. It's like spontaneous combustion. Absolutely, nobody did it. No, nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. All they know is it's there. I believe everyone had conceded the car was not going to get finished. Let's just get what we can do done to it and try not to ruin any more things like the night before. I've been stressed for a couple weeks a little bit trying to make sure this thing gets done. Joe came in on his day off on Sunday. 
and worked on it, which was awfully nice of him. I think if it weren't for old Joe this time, I wouldn't have made my deadline. Well, Joe's the one that restored the car and put the car all together. When I'd been working on it for months and months and didn't see any help, and then, now I'm not saying from Mark, but. Uh, it was pushing it very hard. And if we did it, we did it like to wow, but I think if we needed an extra day. I don't believe this car will be ready on time. The man, Let's the put gentleman. Put on that nose and sand it down. The gentleman could pull in the parking lot any minute and haul it away. He's either got to stay overnight a couple of nights or take it unfinished. Why don't you open up the doors necessary for us to be able to go over there and get that hood. Yeah, Set us up with the air ratchet and the, are those 916s or half inch bolts? I on the 69 B body. They have? I believe they're 916s, but thanks for playing. Matter. It doesn't matter, does it? Thanks for playing. Should I or should I not question the knowledge oh. of the great one? Hey, Darren, grab that cardboard box and bring it over here. I need to clean the bottom of this hood. Which box are you talking around. about, Mark? There's a large, flat cardboard box in there. You know, that in that room right there. A large cardboard black box. You really see a large cardboard black box? One guy will hold it while the other one washes it. No, I don't see it. The camera people don't see it. He said it's in this room. Large cardboard black box in this room. I don't see it. Nobody sees it. Does that look black to you? Does it look, does it look flat? You know, from my it's like a girl when they arrange it. Farouk the can is started screaming that. I don't know what language Nando speaks. It's not English, it's not Spanish, it's not Spanglish. I think he's got his own little language, he speaks his own little book. Most of the time, I just agree with whatever he's saying, it seems to work. Whatever he's, because he usually doesn't talk bad, so whatever he says, I agree with it, and it seems to work out okay. Take your time, Nando. Just <laughs> dumb and dumber, look at that. The market start picking a, a be offensive. It's because uh, things don't go his way. But Royals are ridiculous of the isn't he? Really? Okay, the more stressed Mark gets, the dumber we get. There's Royals head. There it is. Somebody should put a shift pattern in the top of his head like that. We just need a shifting pattern in the top of his head. When Mark's stressed, everybody I think everybody's stressed. Don't worry, take your time. I'm, hey, I'm trying, Joe, okay? Oh boy, somebody's gonna get hit tonight. <laughs> well, Nando's the one I'm gonna being... authorize a sweep kick here in a minute. Mark gets a little more uh, verbally challenging. If I can help one freak realize his disfigurements and he does something about that, the world's a little better place. Forward. Well, the kid was wrong. Not started? No. Yes, it is. No, it's not a 916. Oh, I was right. Yeah. You want to say that again? The camera? Oh, God damn it. What do you want? It's the always fine tuning to do after you get it put together. We don't really have much time for fine tuning right now. I, I really didn't do much. I painted a few bolts, handed a few tools, did a few things, terrorized, tormented people just like I normally do. I'll never do one again. I'll never do one of these. Absolute misery. All it's been is misery. All the way through. Honestly, as much trouble as this car was, I think I'll have less actual trouble doing that CUDA than I will doing this one. Everything on this car is red. It's impossible to find the parts for it. If you look inside, it's got red seat belts, red trim panels, red armrests, red pads, red dash, red steering wheel. Everything on the car, garnish moldings, everything's red which is really pretty when it's done, but coming up with all that stuff is almost impossible. Uh, 
The guy got here around noon on Saturday and the Challenger that he brought out was in pretty good shape. I mean, there's a lot of little things on it. It's kind of like our Coronet. There might be some things on it that you'd do differently if you had a little more time. The car we got in, it really looked good from a distance, but as you got up close to the car, you could see a lot of imperfections, a lot of wrong piece and parts on the car. It was an all right car, but if you're gonna put your name on a car, or say this is what it is, I mean, the guy pretty much wrote you know, a small novel online about the car and used all these colorful words. It, it, it needed like a, it's not a full restoration. It was a lot of detail and not done. What do you think of this? It's okay, it's all right. It's fair, it's got a huge old swelling coming up through this quarter right here. It looks like somebody put a TA antenna on the wrong side of the car. There are problems with the black car that I would like to just redo the whole car, and it was sold to us as a driver. It wasn't sold as a complete, beautiful OE restoration, so there were no surprises there. Okay, so here's the fender tag for it. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, WS23L9G138. Okay. 128. WS23L9G138128. All right. So title and fender tag. I'll put that in my box. And you must have a title and fender tag to that no, they one. Did, they didn't give me nothing for that. All they told me is give you the car and the keys. So they might have, they might, oh. I think they overnight that to you. Okay. Okay. I'm a little bit out of the loop on the transaction. The black challenger is here, and I think it's probably what Larry's expecting. The numbers are all right. So I, I, from that standpoint, I think he's fine. But what was your and Larry's discussion on titles and fender tags? I've got your title and fender tag here, but your guy says he didn't get one from you. Okay. Okay. Then I better do the same thing back to you, huh? And he didn't send them? Hello. He says he just doesn't normally trust his drivers to take the tag and the title when they drive. So he said he's gonna FedEx it on Monday, but I think I'm gonna go get my Fender tag and title back and, and FedEx them on Monday too. This has been just a nightmare to get done. I am so glad that it's going away. I couldn't be happier. I hate this car. I've grown to actually hate it. what I do. Everybody's saying, oh, you're not going to make that car. You're not going to make that car done. It's not going to be done by D-Day. Oh, I'm sorry. Two freckles past the hair says it's D-Day and it's done. So can somebody help me with So the car goes along like this, and it hits, when he loses control, it hits this embankment right here. That's where the problem started to happen for him, but at 100 miles an hour, he can't do much about it. So he's going along, left quarter panel gets hit. That flips it around to the other side, gets hit. Then it ricochets him, according to his words, across the street over into the other embankment, which is what made the left-hand quarter go up, right, well, okay, hi. The car's still here. So the left-hand quarter, left-hand front apron gets pummeled into it, Ping pongs it back over to the middle of the road where it comes to a complete rest. Okay, now what do we got to do? We got to duplicate those poles. We got to grab it on the right. We do. Talking about. Okay, you're not gonna pay attention. Let's get. Let's just go start working on it. Let's do that. I don't understand. Simple, simple thing. Yeah, but we're still gonna go ahead and walk out the door. So we're done, right? Hello. Let's roll. I don't. We got work, man. Okay, that's good. Now go to the right. 
I'm over here. Yeah, that's good. There we go. Darren, put your little feet together. Yep, we're gonna go eat. That's nice. Neck brace and all, huh?